Aloha and welcome to the ANS 2011 annual meeting here in Honolulu, Hawaii. My name is Jay McBride and I'm today's moderator for the press briefing. Uh, we're joined by members of the press here in attendance as well as by those on conference call. Today we welcome Dr. Jacqueline French, lead author of the abstract titled Global Phase 3 Trial of Pram Panel. Did I say that correctly? Prampanil, a selective non-competitive AMPA receptor antagonist as adjunctive therapy in patients with refractory partial onset seizures. After Dr. French's presentation, we'll take questions first by those here in attendance, um, and then, if time allows, by conference call. Please use the uh, roaming microphone that Heather will have, and remember to identify yourself and your media outlet before you ask your question. Just a reminder that this presentation is under embargo until 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Hawaii Time, tomorrow, Wednesday, April 11th. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jacqueline French. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for your interest in my work and in epilepsy and in this study. Uh, I'm going to pre present you with some new data on a phase three trial uh, with doses of parampanel that have not been tried before in other trials. So this trial went up to 12 milligrams, whereas prior, tr uh, prior trial, which was also positive, went only up to eight milligrams. And I'm also going to try and uh, bring you into the interesting world of epilepsy clinical trials at the current time. Uh, we do our initial studies in epilepsy to try and prove that a drug has efficacy uh, in the patients who are at most need, who are the patients with treatment-resistant epilepsy. And we do these studies as add-on studies because, as you might imagine, uh, giving somebody a placebo who has a serious disease uh, would be very difficult. So therefore, doing monotherapy studies against placebo would be well-nigh impossible. So our initial studies in epilepsy are always in the treatment-resistant population and are always as add-on therapy. And recently, because those patients have many, many options, as all of you know, we're always looking for better options because uh, those treatment-resistant patients right now have a very, very low likelihood of maintaining seizure freedom with the available therapies uh, out there. So we're looking for better therapies, but trying to convince somebody to enroll in a randomized placebo-controlled add-on trial when they still have many drugs that are on the market they haven't tried becomes more and more difficult, and therefore the trials have been going global in an attempt to try and find more patients to be recruited for the studies. And I have some interesting data to show you about the ramifications of globalization of trials, and this is not only true for epilepsy, I believe, but is probably true for other indications as well. But let's start with the Parampanel data itself. And uh, as I said, uh, study 306, which was an earlier study, which was uh, uh, presented at the American Epilepsy Society meeting in December, studied two, four, and eight milligrams of parampanel. And this study uh, explored the higher doses of eight and 12 milligrams of parampanel. It was one of two pivotal phase three studies that are identical. They were study 304 and 305. I'm presenting 305, uh, 304, and 305 will likely be presented in the summer. So this was the first study to be completed of the two, and it was performed in the USA, Canada, and Central and South America. So the, uh, the study design is very familiar to anybody who uh, has seen previous epilepsy studies. It was a randomized placebo-controlled add-on study, as I said. Patients uh, were required to be having frequent seizures. They underwent a baseline of six weeks where seizures were counted, uh, after which they were randomized to either placebo or one of the two doses and, the, uh, and were titrated to those doses over a six-week titration period. After that, they entered a 13-week maintenance period. This was a parallel study, again, 12 milligrams, 8 milligrams, and placebo. Uh, and after that, they had an option of entering an open-label extension period. Uh, 534 patients were assessed for eligibility, and 390 patients were randomized, 121 to placebo, 133 to parampanel, and uh, 8 milligrams, and 134 to parampanel, 12 milligrams. Uh, of the placebo patients, 
87% completed and 12% discontinued. And this was not very different from the results in the 8 milligram group where 85% completed and 14% discontinued. There was a slightly higher discontinuation rate in the 12 milligram group where 74% completed and 25%, dis approximately 25% discontinued. And as with all studies, uh, the majority of discontinuations in the higher dose group were due to adverse events. 17% uh, of the patients discontinued in that group due to adverse events. But the discontinuation due to adverse events in the 8 milligram group was not particularly different from the placebo group with only 6 0.8% discontinuing due to adverse events versus 5.8% in the placebo group. The demographics of the multiple groups were approximately equivalent, uh, so there was uh, no confounding uh, that we could see in terms of uh, baseline population. The endpoints in epilepsy trials have become a little more complicated lately because there are different endpoints that are required from the FDA in order to prove that a drug is effective versus the EMA, the European <coughs> uh, Regulatory Agency. So what the FDA likes to see is the percent change in seizure frequency in 28 days, whereas the FDA, I'm sorry, the EMA would like to see 50% responder rate, uh, which the FDA does not find particularly interesting as an outcome. So I'm going to present to you both of those. Uh, I will also, uh, tell you that there were two populations that were evaluated. There was a uh, full ITT, and this is what the FDA required as the outcome. Uh, you're probably familiar with this FDA requirement. Um, this is all treated patients who have had one dose of the drug and, took, uh, and had any post-baseline seizure data at all. There was also an assessment of ITT, which was all treated patients with more than two weeks of post-baseline seizure data. Um, the primary uh, outcome uh, originally was not the FDA preferred outcome. So what I'm going to actually show you is the FDA preferred outcome. And I'm happy to say that the study was successful. Uh, if you look at the full ITT and look at the median percent change in seizure frequency, which again is the FDA preferred outcome, the uh, placebo group had a 20.95% reduction uh, in median uh, seizure frequency. The 8 milligram group had a 26.34% reduction with a P of 0.03, and the 12 milligram group had a 34% reduction, 34.5% reduction, uh, P equal 0.02. Uh, when you look at responder rate, uh, it was a little more complicated. Uh, the 50% responder rate overall uh, was a relatively high placebo responder rate of 26.4%. Uh, the 8 milligram group had a 37.6% 50% responder rate, and the parampanel 12 milligram per day had a 36.1% 50% um, responder rate. And the p-values on that was 0.08 for the 8 milligram group and 0.09 for the 12 milligram group. If you look, however, only at complex partial and secondarily generalized seizures, leaving out the simple partial seizures or uh, auras or uh, seizures that tend to be less disabling, you see more of a difference with the placebo responder uh, median percent change in seizure frequency being 17.88%. Uh, the 8 milligram a day being 33% and the parampanel 12 milligram per day being 33%. So uh, when we're looking at uh, treatment emergent adverse events, the most common treatment emergent adverse events occurring more than 10% of the time were the standard ones that you see for anti-epileptic drugs, dizziness, somnol somnolence, and irritability, and I can give you the numbers. They certainly were dose-related. Um, and that's the primary data that I was going to present to you in terms of the outcome of the trial, and we're very happy that it was a successful trial. Uh, but the interesting other thing that was discovered when looking at this trial, or I find it particularly interesting, is the regional differences. So if you look at the percent change in seizure frequency, 
Uh, and we talked about the somewhat high placebo responder rate, and I think that you're all aware that placebo responder rates are rising in many conditions uh, across neurology and outside of neurology. Um, if you look at North America alone, the placebo responder rate was approximately 10%, and the treatment effect was, uh, and I don't have the exact numbers here, but it was approximately 27% for the medium dose do, uh, group and uh, approximately 39% for the high dose group, and I can get you the exact numbers. Uh, so there was a beautiful dose response relationship if you look at the North American patients alone, and the uh, p-value on that was uh, less than 0 0.001. However, if you look at the non-North American patients who comprised about half of the group, uh, the placebo responder rate was about 25%. The treatment effect was less than 25%. So the numbers went exactly in the opposite direction, and obviously the P was non-significant. So um, you either have to believe that the drug for some pharmacogenomic region, reason doesn't work outside of North America, which we, would be very unlikely, and certainly it worked in the earlier trial at lower doses in Europe and Eastern Europe and other places, or you have to believe that outside of the United States in the particular uh, areas that the trial was done, the selection of patients may have compromised the ability to see an effect. Um, the interesting thing to me is that the study could have, again, been done and been positive with half the number of patients um, in North America alone, but when you start globalizing and perhaps increasing the variability in patients, uh, you actually can double the amount of patients in the trial and get a less significant result. So I will stop there and ask for questions. <laughs>